the inevitable has arrived. Colorado has its first two presumptive cases of COVID-19. No reason to panic, just prepare. Though the state's initial response is not confidence inspiring. We can have more faith in the frontline healthcare workers who are getting ready to treat patients. Part of your training is to prepare for an environment that we are currently in. We'll look at the pros and cons of Colorado's public option health bill. Denver can't seem to attract minority teachers at a time when the city desperately needs them. And a local landmark is about to disappear. A missile prepares to take off next. Well, we knew this day would come when state leaders would step in front of a TV camera and explain that someone in our state has COVID-19 coronavirus. Two people, actually. We learned that today when Governor Jared Polis and health leaders came before the cameras. Colorado's first two cases of COVID-19 are not connected, according to state uh, health leaders, who detailed the first case positive. today and alluded to the, the second. One is a man in his 30s who came in from out of state to Summit County. He'd been exposed to COVID-19 before he flew here. He's now in isolation, apparently doing well. Most people who get coronavirus will be just fine. We're expecting information on the second case later tonight. The state's first announcement of COVID-19 cases was filled with some questionable claims. Colorado's taking an aggressive approach to testing, and we are testing cases that may be suspect and people that aren't uh, yet hospitalized. It actually appears that the state is testing at about 12% of its capacity. A bit more than 100 people have been checked. It is only a matter of time until we see new cases, so now's the time to take some common sense precautions. And for that, uh, Nine Health expert Dr. Pyle Coley is, is here with me now. We knew this day was coming. Does it substantively yes, change Colorado's fight against COVID-19 to know the cases are here? In a word, no. I mean, we've been prepared, we're ready, but I think now that it's here, it's much more real. And I think now it's become more than just something we talk about, but actually something we're dealing with. One thing that we want to make sure is that people have accurate information mm -hmm. so that they can make good decisions uh, before they ever encounter somebody with COVID-19, if they think they've been exposed themselves and mm -hmm. so forth. And one question that we know people have is, when might I expose someone else if I've been exposed to it? Let's listen to something that Governor Polis had to say today. He was asymptomatic at the time. That means when he traveled at the airport, when he was on the airplane, he was asymptomatic, which means there is a low risk of transmission, non-contagious when you're asymptomatic generally, and that's according to the latest information from the CDC. Therefore, there's no reason at this time to believe that other travelers uh, were exposed per current CDC guidance. Governor Polis brushing off concerns about any air travelers that might have shared a plane or a terminal with this guy who has COVID-19 who came in on February 29th. What do you think when you heard him say that? I, I thought his statement was too strong. I mean, saying that you're non-contagious when you're asymptomatic is not what the science is showing. Now, he's right in the sense that the majority of cases are most contagious when they're symptomatic, but you can still be, be spreading the virus when you're, you know, have no symptoms or when you before you become symptomatic after infection. People have gotten the message about hand washing. Yes. <laughs> Let's talk about beyond that. If people want to take smart steps to protect themselves, maybe they got somebody vulnerable in their family. Yeah. Uh, what can they be doing beyond the hand washing? Yeah, I think this is going to change the way we live our lives and we have to really acknowledge that fact. And before you make any big decision about where to travel, whether to go to a big sporting event, even whether to go out to eat, ask yourself three questions. Who, why and where? Who's going out? Is it a healthy person? Is it someone sick? Why are you going out? Is it absolutely necessary? Is it for recreation? Is it important to your life? And where are you going? Are you going to a big place where there's a lot of coronavirus cases? Are you going to Europe or are you going to Japan or somewhere like that? And I think the combination of those three questions really helps you to make the decision about, is this the sensible thing to do? Mm -hmm. Because we need to own our health right now. The government is sending us a message, but we as Coloradans and as individuals need to interpret that message for ourselves. Preparation is not panic. Preparation is the opposite of panic. It is, exactly. is very calming. Dr. Pilecoli, thank you so much for your help. I appreciate thank it today. Uh, one final word about what we learned and what we did not learn this afternoon. Got to be honest with you. I see nothing of concern about the first two COVID-19 cases themselves because we knew that coronavirus was coming to Colorado. That's why we've been talking about making smart, individualized preparations based on your family situation. What was not super encouraging was the state's initial attempt at a response. The governor's questionable claim about when people are contagious and when they aren't. The state's head shaking suggestion that it is aggressively testing when it's at about 12% of capacity, done about 100 tests. 
And then Governor Polis saying that the state does not know whether this patient who flew in for outdoor recreation in Summit County was skiing. Come on. It is crucial that leaders maintain public trust while we navigate COVID-19. If they aren't going to tell us where the guy went in Summit County because they think it will hurt the ski industry, well then just say so, but at least tell us that you're trying to trace his contacts there to protect vulnerable people. Because I just don't believe that health investigators didn't ask the guy where he'd been. Healthcare workers are in a unique and unenviable position as we get ready for COVID-19. They will be on the front lines looking at the very real possibility that they themselves could be effect infected. They know it's part of the job. My name is Andrew French. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at St. Anthony North Health Campus. I'm also uh, actively practicing and board certified emergency medicine physician. One of the great things about emergency medicine and emergency medicine training programs around the United States is that part of your training is to prepare for an environment that we are currently in. When a patient comes in, sometimes they are truly concerned about what they've heard or what they know. Sometimes they're concerned about their family or their friends. As a care provider, you have to mentally prepare for something like this. Even though we were all trained uh, to face these kinds of issues, and you have to understand what the statistics are around uh, what's going on right now internationally and nationally. You have to understand what's going on in the state of Colorado. You have to understand your own hospital or department's protocols in order to keep yourself safe, other patients safe, uh, and frankly, your coworkers safe. I think the media is, is doing the best job that they can to keep people informed. Part of the way that we keep people healthy and part of the way that we limit spread of the disease is to keep people well informed what we know about how it's spread uh, in communicating the latest updates. Our next question tonight comes from a viewer named Nick. He wants to know the pros and cons of the public option proposed by Democratic Governor Jared Polis. So, Nick, the governor is vocal on this, but it's the legislature that writes the bill. So let's explore the pros and cons with the state legislator behind the bill introduced today and one of its opponents. Colorado option or public option is not uh, government insurance, not the way we're doing it. Uh, this is a insurance plan that you will buy from an already existing private insurance company. I think what you're going to see is ultimately government control of health care if this plan is executed the way that I think it will, which um, is going to lead to less options for Coloradans if health insurance companies are ultimately kicked out. If you get your insurance through your employer, the Colorado option will not impact you. What we're trying to do is create a new option for those who want to buy it. Nobody Nobody's forced onto this plan. No taxes are increased in order to pay for the plan. But we've never in Colorado really had an issue of quality and access from our hospitals, at least not in the almost 30 years that I've lived here. Colorado option will also mean that health insurance premiums are going to be reduced statewide an average between 9 and 20 percent. If we're going to start rate setting on hospitals and really treating them like a utility, I'm really worried that ultimately you'll see what happens anytime you apply rate setting is at some point the the quality and the access deteriorates. But we believe that by reasonably reining in some of the costs and, and making sure that the hospitals that are already making massive profits uh, help with this effort, that we can make sure that more people actually go to their local hospital because they will have insurance. If we chase all the health insurance companies away by these um, really strict requirements on them, what in the world are we going to do to get them back? Once you chase insurance companies away, I think it's a one-way street and the only option once health insurance companies are gone is to have the state run health insurance. Guess who's back? Back again. President Donald Trump, and he is not a superstitious man because he's coming to Colorado next Friday, the 13th. Trump is keeping his promise to work hard to reelect Republican Senator Cory Gardner. The president will be here for a fundraising lunch in Denver. Just got a look at the invitation. Uh, the uh, president's name just just slightly bigger than Gardner's. He's the headliner. He's the draw. You, you got to read the small print, though. Always read the small print because that's where they lighten your wallet. And here it says for the small donation of $100,000, you get a table, a photo and VIP seating for two. More than one million of you returned primary ballots for Democrats in the primary. Now we know the Colorado Democratic Party really only counted half of them. And now that Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren has dropped out of the race, state Democrats are counting even fewer ballots. That means that politics guy Marshall Zellinger, like your old GPS, is recalculating. 
You have to get 15 percent in the Democratic primary to have your votes counted by the Democratic Party. That's why Bernie Sanders, Joe Biden, Mike Bloomberg and Elizabeth Warren all had their votes acknowledged by the Colorado Democrats on Tuesday. But yesterday, Bloomberg dropped out. So the Democrats took his votes out of the equation as though they never happened. Then this morning, the calculators were recalculating when Warren stopped actively running for president. So even though the state shows Sanders with 37 percent compared to 12 other candidates, the Colorado Democratic Party has him with nearly 60 percent compared to Biden's 40 percent. But Bloomberg and Warren are still eligible for delegates when you isolate the votes in each of Colorado's seven congressional districts. And right now, the math has Sanders with 29, Biden with 21, Bloomberg 9, and Warren 8. For next, I'm Marshall Zellinger with Zero. Ah, poor guy. He really didn't campaign, though. He's mostly just working around here. Part of being a parent is telling your child harmless little lies. Or maybe I'm doing it wrong. I don't know, you can tell me. And let's talk teachers. I actually only had one male teacher of color throughout all of elementary school, all the way up until middle school. Kids can't be what they can't see. Let's talk about what the state's doing to try and attract more minority teaching candidates. And one school with a very visible landmark on its lawn is about to lose it. Coming to you with a parenting question tonight. So I'm trying to I'm trying to get my two year old trying some different foods and any parent knows that condiments help specifically for us salsa, which I've told my daughter is a special sauce that is named after her that only she and no one else can eat. She loves salsa on all kinds of things. But here's the deal. Now that I've planted this, if you happen to see me and my daughter around town at a restaurant or something, I need you to not eat salsa because it's just for her. Cool. Talking with some of you online about this today, I am impressed by the sleight of hand that you have pulled as parents or that your parents pulled on you over the years. Chris told me that his son eats Brussels sprouts because he thinks they're dinosaur eggs. Case said that his parents had him convinced that you had to be 21 years old to order an appetizer at a restaurant just like alcohol. And Case said he believed that for way too long. Somebody else told me that her parents informed her that she was allergic to McDonald's. 
a lie that she believed until she was in college. What's the best harmless food foolery that you have pulled on your kids or had pulled on you? There have got to be some great ones out there, and I could use some tips. Text me, tell me, make the phone buzz, 303-871-1491. So there is this perception about Denver that is keeping teachers away, and it is, it's impacting how kids learn. A lack of diverse classroom teachers is not just a Denver problem, but that doesn't mean that the state's largest school district isn't fixated on fixing it. Anusha Roy explains. Growing up in Aurora, Cedric Miller saw an opportunity. I actually only had one male teacher of color throughout all of elementary school all the way up until middle school. Um, then I had a female teacher of color and then I did not have another teacher of color until college. Now he's studying to be a special education teacher and wants to stay in Colorado, where the state says out of more than 54,000 public school teachers, around an eighth are minorities. In the Denver Public School District, where around 75% are students of color, around 28% of their teachers are. If students have even one teacher of color or teacher who looks like them, they are 39% more likely to graduate from high school. DPS is just one of many districts working on this for years, but why it's a problem is complicated, starting with the obvious issue. We would always love to pay all teachers more. It's not necessarily something that's going to have provide financial stability. DPS also said there aren't enough local teacher candidates to go out of state. And that's when they realized perception is a real problem. When we visit um, places like Atlanta, places like Texas, um, it's not per Denver is not perceived as a place where edge where people of color are have a strong community. The issue extends beyond DPS. The State Department of Education says there's a teacher shortage across the state and that makes it even harder to find teachers who reflect the community. So so partnerships with local universities like the UNC Center for Urban Education is all the more important. They draw directly from the communities of color in the Denver metro area. So far, they've built up a local student population that's 70% minority. Be that driving force for kids of color, kids that look like me, kids that didn't look like me. So DPS hosted an open house this week specifically for minority teacher candidates and the state launched a new program called Teach Colorado simply just trying to do the same thing. And of course, again, this year there's some proposed legislation to investigate this issue more. And those are just a couple of examples mm -hmm. of what the district states, even universities have been trying to do now for years to address this issue. So the teachers have been gathering at the Capitol each year now for these days of mm -hmm. action, kind of like big protests. You see the big sea of teachers out, out front and some teachers notice what's play into the eye, which is you look at that sea of teachers and it is mighty white. Yeah, so that actually happened during the strikes uh, last February. And one of the DPS teachers I talked to said, you know, she looked out over the Capitol and said, oh, this is a problem. I I'm looking in this crowd and this mm -hmm. is a problem. So they actually created the Denver Black Educators Caucus. It's a very new group and just met with the school board to specifically talk about new ways for retention and recruitment. So just another thing that's happening to try to address this. All right, because everybody agrees it's an issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nusha. They wanted to find something striking to put in front of Goddard Middle School to commemorate its opening. Oh my God, <clears throat> what is this 40 foot tall thing sticking up to the sky? Oh yeah, that's it. And now it's about to take off, next.
You know Goddard Middle School? It's the one with the missile. Yeah, that school. The Nike Hercules missile has sat out front for 50 years. It's about to go to make room for parking and security upgrades. Our Corky Scholl took his camera to meet the man who brought the missile to Littleton. Goddard Middle School is iconic for the rocket out front. It kind of makes it unique, and I feel like it's pretty significant. How quickly 1968 to 2020 goes by. I'm Ben Millspa, and I was there at the very beginning of the rocket that we installed at Goddard Middle School back in 1968. In 1968, I was a substitute science teacher for the district Littleton Public Schools, and one of the principals told me that he was going to start a new school with a celebration, and he would like to have my help. And I said yes, because of my aviation aerospace background. I was told that the Pueblo Army Depot had some missiles. I essentially wanted a smaller rocket that would be set on a small platform with a plaque. As it turned out, it was a Nike Hercules. It was 41 feet tall, and it came in on a very large transport. When it arrived, the whole district was absolutely amazed at what they were getting because this rocket was probably three or four times bigger than anybody thought it would be. And when it was sitting out in front of the school, it looked like the school was well protected. <laughs> Alumni asked that the missile be preserved, so it's gonna to go to an aircraft museum in Pueblo. The food fibs we tell our kids have us cracking, out, uh, cracking up. You sent us so many, like, like Rick, who told his kids there was a dessert light on their foreheads that only parents could see when they'd eaten enough for dessert and you have even better ones for us next.
Tonight you've been sharing the food fibs that we tell our children. Robert has always told his kids that if they put their thumb on the little circle on the bottom of the hamburger bun, that the hamburger tastes better. Somebody else texted in to say they told their kids that tofu is chicken and the kids still believe it to this day. And it seems like a bunch of you had parents who told you that when the ice cream truck is playing music, it is out of ice cream. See you next time. Wash your hands.